part of the meeting tonight and that will be the presentations for students of the month. I get to do that up here. Oh and if I could just remind everybody real quick the cell phones if you could turn them to the off or the vibrate or the stun or whatever it is. Thanks. All right. So the way that this works is I'm going to have Well, why don't we start at the senior high school and work our way down and do it backwards. Today will be backwards day. So um, the way that this works is we have the student reps come up uh, from each of the different schools. They'll come up and they'll introduce the students of the month. And so when you get introduced, please come on up and stand right there very awkwardly in front of the, <laughs> of the uh, camera and we'll YouTube it later, okay? So why don't we start out with Pebble in High School. Hello, I'm Mackenzie Moreta, and I'm the ASB Vice President of Pelham High School, and I'd like to introduce our first student of the month, Caitlin Shabazian. graduating as salutatorian from the class of 2014 with an accumulated weighted GPA of 4.61. Outside of her academic achievements, she has many extracurricular activities. Caitlin participated in French Club all four years of high school and was co-president her senior year. She also volunteered extensively at Liberty Elementary School. Between working at the library, helping to build the kindergarten playground, and tutoring through the summer school program, her total volunteer time there reached over 350 hours. Caitlin played lacrosse throughout high school and when Casa Grande and Petaluma High joined forces her junior year and split between JV and varsity, she played for the varsity team her last two years. Her team became the Northern California Junior Lacrosse Association champions last year, the highest award that can be obtained in their league. This year, she is serving as co-captain for the team. Congratulations, Caitlin. Congratulate and thank the people in Caitlin's life supporting her. So, friends, family, neighbors, please stand up so we can acknowledge you as well. Teachers, all of you, let's open. All right, and our next student of the month is Bobby Clark. is a senior at Petaluma High School. He is thankful for the four fulfilling years he has spent at Petaluma High. Augie has played the trumpet for the high school marching band and varsity jazz ensemble for three years. As a member of the band, he recently traveled to New Orleans and experienced the amazing culture of the birthplace of jazz. 
His brightest memory from high school was when the Varsity Jazz Band received the award for Best Jazz Band in Northern California. Augie also played tennis all four years of high school, where he spent time with an amazing group of friends and teammates. In school, Augie preferred to take the more challenging and rigorous courses where he acquired a greater sense for who he is as a student and a person. It is because of these classes that Augie feels more than ready for college and what lies ahead. He plans to attend Seattle University in the fall, where he hopes to set, study political science with a minor in communications. Augie is very honored to be selected as Student of the Month for May, and he would like to especially thank his supportive parents and the wonderful staff at Petaluma High School, who has made his four years at Petaluma High nothing short of exceptional. Congratulations, Augie. accelerated classes, Anika is on the honor roll and has earned the principal's renaissance and gold awards. Teach teachers exclaim, Anika is an excellent student. Her positive attitude em emanates to others and she is a great role model for her peers. She is enthusiastic, determined, motivated, and loves to learn. She is very well liked by all and willing to help out when needed. Teachers love having Anika in the class, stating that she is an awesome person, intelligent, hardworking, and genuinely caring of others. Her peers look up to her, and she is well-liked and respected by all. Annika has many interests and is involved in numerous extracurricular activities. At school, Annika has been on the 7th and 8th grade girls track and team winning league titles two years in a row. In track, Annika competed in long and high jump as well as long distance and sprints. In addition, she is passionate about swimming and competes year-round with the Westside Aqueducts. Annika has won numerous ribbons for the breaststroke, long distance, and freestyle swimming since she began at the age of 12. Annika is also involved in two Roth 4 H club. She has been elected as an officer and is involved in archery and races rabbits. She and her brother developed a breeding program, Mini Lops, and has been one programs for their rabbits at the country fairs, county fairs. Annika studies music and plays violin and guitar as well. Recently, she was honored by being asked to perform at a restaurant and senior center in her teacher's band. The band is called Los Guachis, which is an old style of music indigenous from New Mexico, passed down by generations from year to year. Anika comes back, comes from a close-knit family, and enjoys their vacations, especially when visiting family in Germany. Anika also loves to read, watch movies, and spend time with their friends. Anika's future goals include earning a PhD in the field of medicine with a positive, with a possible emphasis on genetics. She wants to make a difference in states. I want to make a place for myself in the world and leave my mark. Annika plans on continuing with her love of sports and music in high school, as well as maintaining excellent grades while enrolling in high-level classes. Annika's parents state, Annika makes the best pies on the planet. She also is a great big sister, big and little sister to her two brothers. She loves academics and works hard to maintain good grades. I am very proud of my daughter. Congratulations, Annika Schmidt. He is polite, cooperative, and gets along well with others. 
Matthew has continually been on the honor roll and earned the principal silver and renaissance awards, awards while taking high level classes. He currently has a 4.0 and plans on working hard to maintain it throughout his high school years. Matthew has a variety of interests. For example, he's very engaged in community sports. He is on an award winning community teams for baseball, soccer, and basketball. He also volunteers as an umpire for a younger little league baseball division. He truly enjoys being athletic, being part of the team, and mentoring younger students. In elementary school, Matthew was in leadership for fifth and sixth grades, helping with fundraisers, lunchtime activities, and morning announcements. In addition, Matthew has enjoyed, enjoyed playing, drum, playing drums for the last six years. He plays percussion in the honor band and at school, but also enjoys practicing at home. He also likes to play video games, especially online with other players. He takes pleasure in taking family vacations, such as camping in the summer and going to Disneyland with an extended family. Matthew's future goals include attending a good college and possibly studying architectural design or electrical engineering. He is excited about transferring to Pendleton High School and taking four years of engineering and architectural CAD classes as a basis for his future career. Matthew's parents state, Matthew works really hard on his schoolwork. He sets really hard standards for himself. Every, everything he does, he gives 100%. We are very proud of him and can't wait to see what he accomplishes in the future. Congratulations, Matthew Kulipa.
He was an early member of the budding peer mentor program at CASA. The program brought in freshmen whose performance in school was not where it should and could be. It gave them an opportunity to be around successful upperclassmen who would be a good influence on the struggling younger students and would be able to assist them in their studies. Another important facet of his life has been his love for the game of basketball. Although it has not been the central focus of his high school career, it is an integral part of who he is and provides him with an indispensable outlet. Looking to the future, Ode hopes to become a successful engineer or researcher in the field of physics. He has a deep interest in math and the sciences, specifically physics, that drive his intention to enter these fields. He will be attending UC San Diego the coming, this coming fall with, for the time being, a major of engineering physics. Congratulations. <laughs> would also like to congratulate our other student of the month, Griffin Wigert. <laughs> Griffin was born April 4, 1996 in Charlottesville, Virginia. His parents were both math teachers and they owned two cats, sine and cosine. <laughs> he moved to Petaluma when he was two and attended La Tercera Elementary School through second grade. For third through eighth grade, he attended Live Oak Charter School, a public Waldorf school in the district. His mother also began to work at Live Oak as a math teacher, and Griffin had her as a teacher from sixth through eighth grade. During this time, Griffin inherited a passion for bike racing from his father, who was the AP statistics teacher at Casa Grande, and is also the coach of the high school bike team. He began racing and joined Team Swift, a junior development cycling team. When Griffin got to high school, he joined the mountain bike team and is now the varsity team captain, racing in the NorCal High School Mountain Bike League. He was also the varsity team captain for CASA's cross country team. Over the past four years of high school, Griffin has taken eight AP classes, earned the overall academic excellence award from the CASA faculty, the Harold Mahoney Family Community Achievement Award, and was the Honors Biology Student of the Year. For the future, Griffin will study industrial engineering at Montana State University. He has also been awarded a four-year four full tuition Army ROTC scholarship and looks forward to college life in Montana and becoming an officer in the U.S. Army. Congratulations. <laughs> as of today, 7,514 students in the Petaluma City School District. And seven of you were here tonight based upon your academic excellence. And I'm not the stats uh, professor or student, but I can tell you that that's pretty darn good. So congratulations for that. Secondly, um, I think it's appropriate that we also, for the seven of you that are here tonight, thank you because there are a whole lot of people that put a lot of their life into providing you these opportunities to be so successful. Um, you have obviously taken that and run, but I also want to acknowledge for you the custodians, the school bus drivers, the cafeteria people, the teachers, the teacher's assistants, the administrators, and even uh, the grizzled old school board members here at the front of the room um, who would like to thank you for taking so seriously the work that they do for you because it gives them great pride and gives us great pride to uh, hear these great stories of Seattle University and ROTC and San Diego and that's just, uh, it, it's just, it, it gives a whole bunch of adults a really good feeling so I want to thank you for that as well. Congratulations. There's a wall on the side of this room that has plaques as you can see uh, of all the students of the months going back to I think 1983 
he will be in there sometime this summer we'll get the new plaque done comes with all kinds of great secret things that I'll tell you about later. You get keys to buildings and all kinds of gift certificates. And actually, not really, but you get a name on a plaque and that's pretty darn important. <laughs> For the eighth graders that are here, um, what you'll notice if you look on those plaques, we don't have a lot of names up there twice. In other words, we don't have a lot of eighth graders that return back as 12th graders. And so I would challenge you to be what we call a doble and get yourself up there twice. That's a pretty rare honor. So I hope that you'll commit to that tonight. And again, I just want to thank you and congratulate you for all your hard work. Congratulations. So we have two other presentations tonight. Uh, and I think We'll look for a little guidance here. Shall I excuse everyone after the second one or after this one? You think this one? Because we are coming up to finals. So what I'll do is this. I want to first encourage you to stay. We would appreciate it if you would stay. That being said, if you feel that you need to go home to do homework or if we're going to go out and celebrate, and I think it's fully appropriate that parents uh, take students of the month out for something, healthy but uh, celebratory, like maybe yogurt, I don't know, sounds good, <laughs> dinner. Uh, I would definitely encourage that, although it's not compulsory. Uh, let's go ahead and take a quick two-minute break. And anybody who do, does need to go, please go. But we have two very important presentations coming up after this, and then I'll break again after that. If anybody would like to stay, we'd love to have you. All right? Fair enough? So you got 120 seconds. Go. Or stay. <laughs> Yes. It's gorgeous. It is. 
that's huge. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful spot. I, know, I, don't know yeah. I think we're up. Mm. All right. All right. So um, this is a joint presentation between Casabani High School and Petaluma High School, two excellent comprehensive high schools in Petaluma. We're lucky to have both of them, I think. Um, and our focus tonight is, is sort of to look ahead and look at an area and a data point that we don't do a lot with or don't, have not done a good question over time, which is where do the kids go once they uh, graduate from the two schools and how do we track whether or not we were successful or not? This, the, the only way to really check whether a school is succeeding is not by its graduation rate. What the kids do five to 10 years down the line, how do they really show that they learned enough and they have the skill set in place to allow them to succeed? Andrew Alha is a social science teacher at Petaluma High and is admittedly very new to this. And, and as you'll see in the data sets we show, we started doing this really in, in January and February. So we got Andrew in and he agreed to do something because I essentially said, Andrew, I need you. And he stepped up. So um, we're, we've been working with our data sets and we've just submitted it to National Student Clearinghouse, which we'll get to in a moment. And we'll have far better data to report in the fall in terms of um, what students have done this year and then we'll be able to backtrack the last six years and add that data. Scott Wigger from, uh, that I think both Scott and Eric you've seen before making presentations like this and um, they'll be stepping up in a moment. So this, this is really just a quick overview. At the end of this, we do have, as you might expect, we have an ask. We have a thing that we think the two schools would benefit from and some uh, assistance from the district and the board that we believe is critical to, in, in the sense of using data <coughs> to make sure that we're doing the right thing and that we are assisting kids appropriately. So. Can I just right. add, yep. add a word before yep. we start? So I would appreciate if the, if the board recognized that the presentation tonight is really a, a work in progress, uh, which began last year following Scott and my presentation. It, really, the ask was to consider ways to help the district get a, a district-wide view of college readiness. So this is a first attempt at doing that. Um, and it's the beginning of something that David said is really important. It is. I strongly believe where the rubber meets the road for any district. Are we getting our kids ready for college and careers and when they graduate, do they go and are they successful? Um, I think it's fitting that we begin with students of the month. That represents one cohort of student. What we're gonna show you now is how the whole district does. So we've compiled what we believe are the most important college ready indicators, college and career ready indicators, all of which I'm sure you're very familiar. Oh, okay. So um, <coughs> one, of the, one of the big ones is the A through G requirements set out by the CSUs and, and the UCs, looking at the percentage of students who, at the time they graduate, would they meet the minimum requirements to get it? Um, obviously, oftentimes, that's not even the actual requirements to get into a UC these days. Um, but it's the minimum, and this is sort of this is an, this is a really important one for us because it, well that's the number that actually are are could it possibly be accepted? Coincidentally, it's about the same as our six-year graduation rate, um, and we have a lot of work to go on it. Particularly, I think when it comes to math, in this particular case, that's where a lot of kids are falling off. And the numbers may seem low; they may seem high. Um, for relative comparison, Casa Grande in 2007 was at 24% when we started looking at this data, the year we implemented small learning communities. So we've come a long way in a few years. Um, more on that later, but you know, the belief that when you pay a ton attention to something, it moves, it responds, called the Hawthorne effect. I think we're paying attention to data points that are beginning to move because we're putting them in front of teachers and teachers are talking about why they're important and what we can do to improve them. That's one of the really important things about paying attention to this, this data set. Just to add one thing, there's two ways to address this. One is by <laughs> looking at students and saying, have you considered taking this class? The other one is by taking the class itself and making it A to G. So pushing the, the rigor of the course and the options for the kids and then, particularly if you can do that at the freshman level, you start to, to create an envelope of kids who are far more ready. We, in our particular populations of uh, students with disabilities, it's, a, it's a, certainly a challenge because many of those students have, have difficulty accomplishing and reaching a college prep level. But we gotta get them there a little bit earlier than we are because otherwise they fall off this, this landscape too, too early in their high school career and can't get back home. Phoebe? 
Um, there's percentages of both the high school. So the 38% and the 36% reflect how many are actually eligible to apply in the four year. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's correct. You're how right. many actually and it's not it's not that far off. I mean the actual as you'll see the numbers of kids who would who attend four year schools is gonna be in the low thirties in both 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 cases. So most of the kids who are eligible do so. It's that the other two thirds, or not quite two thirds, are not not in that landscape at all and we've gotta we've gotta change that. There was a study by the way that came out this morning about the about I don't know if anyone read this, about salaries for college. Did everyone see this? I saw it I saw it briefly on the Today Show as I flipped through breakfast, but Search, search around for studies around college readiness and salary over time, and it's significant, huge. I mean, it, we've, we've been talking about career and college, and both are important, but we have to make sure that we're addressing both. I just, it's a data point to look at, for sure, if you check that out. Um, so l last year, one of the, I, I presented one of the pieces of data that we've been paying attention to is the EAP, uh, which was designed by the CSUs to, touch co to test college readiness. Um, for all juniors during the STAR test. So suddenly there was a reason the STAR test meant something to in individual, individual uh, takers of it. Um, and so it comes back with basically three statuses a student can be in their senior year. They can be college ready, conditionally college ready, and then not ready. Uh, the good news is they have senior year. So if they're not ready, that's okay. That just says we gotta work hard on senior year. If you're conditionally ready, it means that same deal, you gotta take care of some business during senior year. And then if you are ready, it doesn't mean you get to kick back senior year, but it's a nice sign that says, yes, I'm already, I'm already ready to meet those standards and I don't need to take all the, the pre-tests for uh, replacement tests for a, a CSU. Um, so some of the, the interesting, I think the data points here, um, particularly as it comes in, so if you look at the, uh, the second bullet point for Casa Grande, so, our junior year, 19% um, of, of students are college ready in math, which we didn't think was particularly good. Uh, we've been on a, on a five year campaign though to, to up that. And one of the things that I did was I mined through all the transcripts at the end of senior year to see, how many, see what percent of those students who are conditional are taking a math class. And we're up over 90% now. So very, I can count on two hands about the number of seniors who aren't taking a math class who are conditionally ready. So by the time they graduate, our, uh, our math red college readiness is up to 41%. Um, this gets a little bit later, I'll make a little plug for our ask later, is that some of the, these things aren't available at Pebble Mahai because they don't have a data person. We had a five year grant that paid for my time to kind of do all this stuff. And even this year, site council has picked that up um, but they don't have that, and that's one of those things we need to look at district-wide is who, who's going to do this? Someone has to do it. In this case, it, it's me. Uh, but some, someone has to do it. Someone has to have time to do it. And then that's also partially reflected with the fact that David mentioned you know, it wasn't until January, February that we really got started in this direction as far as mining the data for Pebble So that, that would be something that reflected. Mm -hmm. Yeah? What is college ready mean? Um, well, essentially, the, col the colleges have set that standard and said, if you're college ready, you can basically walk in and take English 1A or a college level math class such as statistics, finite math, uh, pre-calc, and get college credit. If you're not college ready, what you'd have to do is take remedial classes that, either, that would not get you college credit. So you'd pay whatever the tuition rate is, take some remedial math class just to get into uh, a regular math class. You may be able to be eligible to go to college, but once you get there, you're not going That's right. to take. Right, but it's also a big stumbling block to completing college, particularly within a recent amount of time. If you're one, two, three years behind in math, um, a lot of kids just don't finish. That's expensive. But it would not preclude someone from being A to G eligible. Right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, next slide. Okay. Um, so over the last few years, we've, we've continued to track our advanced pl placement growth, which we've seen as a very a positive thing, uh, both in the numbers of takers, and I've got more detailed information on this, of the overall trends, but our, the numbers of takers, the numbers of tests continue to go up. Um, and what's really interesting is that our pass rate has been pretty steady, roughly in that 70%, which puts us in one of the top two schools in the, in, in the county. Um, in terms of the number of takers and our consistent pass rate in the three to five on AP test. And then to look at the AP data, Pebble Mahai, 
So the big thing that jumps out is the increase in the number of tests taken from last year to this year. Part of what's been occurring at the site is uh, expanding the access of AP courses. So identifying those who have been taking college prep courses that could do well in AP courses and encouraging them to challenge themselves. And so that's where you see the, the increase in the number of tests taken that would also reflect in an increase of uh, number of test takers. And just to the PSAT results that um, the district was and board was kind enough to allow at Pebble Mahai has helped us to do some of this work to say, you know, you have the potential to do this. And it's something that I think Casa would benefit from too in the fall is to have sophomores able to take that PSAT. So we have another data set to mine to use to encourage students to take this kind of coursework. My understanding is that request is in the pipeline for us to be able to give a PSAT for all the reasons David just discussed. And those are really impressive numbers at Petaluma High. That increase is, is substantial from one year to the next. Oh, okay. So one of the things that came out of the last meeting uh, last year was a district-wide subscription to the National Student Clearinghouse. We had, been, we had been subscribing it through our grant, and with my time, I've been doing that. I've been working with Andrew now to get Petaluma on board for that. So one of the things it does is a couple of the key data points that we look at are what's, what percentage of students are actually, actually enrolling in college immediately following, as well as any time within that, that first year after graduation. So this number, particularly for the two-year junior college, actually goes up. Um, the, the, the timing isn't quite right for it, but it typically goes up to about close to 50%. So what's really something about this is one, this was a big eye-opener for us, because you, we knew it, we knew a lot of kids went to the JC, but when you see 50% and you go, wow, we had 400 people graduate, that's 200 kids a year going to the Santa Rosa JC. So what are we doing for those kids? And honestly, we weren't doing a lot, and that's, that's what we want to talk about that a little bit. Now that's actually enrolled, not indicating where they were yeah. confirmation this is that yeah this is actually enrolled based on student IDs and then and we actually can track the individual student although we look at it at it, at it more globally and then we've been tracking also the the, the six year graduation rate to that's not self -reported. that is not which is interesting because our counseling staff had been doing self reporting and when we started getting this there was whoa not the, the reality and the fantasy were totally two different things for sure well, we just surveyed our, our freshman class. One of the questions is, what are your plans after high school? 80% of them are going to four-year college. So, we just worked it. So, yeah, yes. <laughs> a, a lot changes between freshman year and graduation. So yeah, just about. On the two-year junior college one, was that just enrolled for any reason, or is that enrolled, like, I, I don't know how the JC does it, or did they code you in as a graduating senior into, like, a, um, Associate Arts degree track by the way. As I understand, as long as you're as long as you're enrolled, um, that we do track then how and we're working closer with the JC trying to figure out so what percent actually get an associate's degree, what percent actually then transfer because that's going to be the next that's meaningful. Cool. Yeah. And uh, this little jumpstart project we've got going that that's going to be coming out soon. I think. If you were to guess, and I'm going to put you on the spot, but the two-year junior college of that 42 and 44 percent. What percent go to Santa Rosa? Um, I, well, I have I have the exact numbers, and in fact, I'm going to give them to you on a little piece here. Over a six-year, over six-year, Casa Grande alone has sent 1,490 kids to Santa, to Santa Rosa, JC. Are you I just wanted yeah. I just wanted to, yeah. to say I'm really glad to see this because I have three students, three children who went to Casa. All three of them went to the JC. And as of Father's Day, all three of them will have a four-year degree. My oldest, who graduated in 2003 from CASA, graduated from Davis. My son graduated in December from San Jose State. And my youngest will graduate from Santa Cruz on Father's Day. So it's a lot. It's a lot. Yep. So these are, you know, a few hand-picked sets of data of, of many that we look at. Um, some, our study analysis of them is sustained. Others, we find we get no traction. They don't mean a lot. But it's important to recognize these sets of data have traction at both sites. They mean a lot. We get a big response from teachers. 
and a response from students, which is unlike a lot of data in education, which is pretty meaningless, uh, hard to sell, in other words. Um, so based on these data sets and others, what are, what are some of the areas that we're really focused on? Where is the data guiding us? Um, three important points. At both schools, we're looking intensively at the ninth grade in a way that we haven't before. And increasingly, looking at the transition from seventh, eighth to ninth grade. And both of us are doing outreach, both high schools doing outreach to the junior highs, our primary feeder schools, trying to build those effective bridges. So we know how students are doing uh, academically, socially, emotionally. We create students to watch lists before they even set foot on CASA's campus so we know who needs extra support. That's a perfect example of the kinds of things we're doing for ninth graders at CASA. Another example, we're um, implementing a new course we're very excited about called College and Career Choices. It's a semester-long course that's going to back up to our human interaction. Its primary focus is the creation of a 10-year um, online uh, college and career plan that each student will create as a ninth grader. We're going to have about 200 kids enrolled in this class. Um, we're very excited about it. It's piloted in Santa Barbara. Every student in Santa Barbara School District is required to take it because they're seeing such positive results. So just another example of the way that data is informing our practice at school. And Can you talk a little bit more about what that looks like? Yeah, so the, the, the class has many curricular components. It begins with uh, an analysis really of self, a kind of self-awareness unit. What, what, what are the things you enjoy? What are you good at? What are your aptitudes? Students engage in an online uh, program which connects their aptitudes to specific careers. There's a whole economics unit to it. What kind of lifestyle do you want to lead? And what kind of job would you need to pay for that lifestyle? Um, everything from how much food costs to real estate to a car and insurance and college and all the rest. Um, as they're working, they're plugging this stuff into uh, a 10 year plan. The goal of which is that each student uh, updates the plan at the end of every school year. So our hope is that it becomes part of a four year curricula that the student leaves high school with and takes to the junior college or the college of their choice. In Santa Barbara, the counselors at Santa Barbara Junior College get those 10-year plans. So when the student transitioning from high school gets to the junior college, they sit down with their counselor and they look at the 10-year plan. So it becomes the guide for courses. It shows up at IEP meetings, at SST meetings. It's on the counselor's desk anytime a student comes in as a motivator, as a tool to redirect the student or remind them what they're doing and why they're doing it. We were really impressed. Because even the, the best intended parents, it's amazing sometimes what you take for granted that, of course, others know. I mean, little things. My daughter's six, and a while back, and they did money, and didn't know a penny was called a penny. I think that no pencil. It was penny, penny. penny. <laughs> well, they were learning money. And I thought, well, I never have money. I always have a car, or dad's paying a work here, because I have three, you know? It's yes. just funny sometimes. I, I imagine that carries through where you think your kids know how much a house costs. And, because you tell them all the time, can't have that with this, you know. Well, all of us in the room, right. myself included, wish that we had done a 10-year plan. That's great. <laughs> I, could, Sorry, I need a 10-year plan now. Yeah, right. <laughs> Take the class. Thank you. Anyway. Is that like a high-looking at that We're going to do something like that through Trojan Connections. So if that's our, our advisory period, we'd run 16 times a year. And we've done a lot of generalized stuff across the curriculum, so 9, 10, 11, and 12 presentations. We're going to use it next year more targetedly. So the ninth grade could have a curricula like this, um, 10th grade, 11th grade. They all have their own elements that they need, and seniors need something more specific around you know, applying for college and I think they're doing. Um, back to our HI, we have a business class. So we call it Freshman Fundamentals. And the idea is that they use that as a time to get really locked in in terms of how they use technology in the rest of their high school and college life. So. There's two different ways to do this, and, but I, I applaud this because I think this is a great way to, to look at it. I think we've got another thing that will work too, but it's, it's finding enough time in a student's day to get all these pieces in place is a challenge, for sure. Um, and I want to jump down for the sake of time to the, to the third point and, and let Scott uh, tell you briefly about a new program at CASA, which we're really excited about, informed directly by this uh, national tracker data, which shows all of our kids going to the JC. 
Yeah, so one of the, the glaring thing was, if you look at the, how, what percent of uh, students are college ready based on the AP and how many students are going to the JC. And I had this, it was one of these eye-opener things where I actually was helping the other day with his UC SA and helping my son with his, with his college applications. And then, I see half my class, they're not doing anything. Their students going to the JC and, oh, we're just going to do that in July, right? They're just, they're, they were basically sidelined. And we realized that a lot of students who go to the JC are, are, are going there for, for various reasons. Um, a lot of times it's first time people who've gone to college, who've never gone to college before, their parents have. So we realized we had no supports in place to help these 50% <coughs> of our graduates get ready for the JC. Not just academically ready, but what it takes to navigate the system. It, it's harder to apply to the JC than it is to a CSU. The application is, it's two steps, it's very convoluted. So I recruited about 35 kids, I called it Jumpstart. I recruited them in January and said, what we're gonna do is we're gonna apply for the JC just like you apply to the UC or the CSU. So you can get financial aid, scholarships, you can do it all. So I worked with the college career counselor and our counselor and we walked them through a process where they did the JC application, Doyle scholarships, concurrent enrollment forms. They did their math and English placement testing, which was great because while they're still in high school, they find out where they stand on that placement test, because right, everybody goes to the JC. That doesn't mean you're going to start at the top. You may be starting six math classes behind. So, um, and in the meantime, we met with the JC. They were really excited about all this, this data, and they actually created a special Counseling 270 class for us, just on, on our calendar, on, on our time. And so I, we got 26 kids to go through that Counseling 270 class. So they got all their application stuff, all, the, all their other stuff done, so in March, they were mentally ready for college. They've done everything. They've made their four-year plan for, for the JC. They have their placement test. They know if they're higher or low, they need to, they need to retake it. Um, and then they're also, they're going to get priority enrollment. So they're a priority three enrollment instead of priority five enrollment, while the other 10,000 students from all the other county schools show up in July, overwhelming the JC. So we've actually started, we've made up a new timeline next year to try to do the same with a larger number beginning in October. So students will apply to CSU, UC, and the JC all at the same time. It's just all, where are you going? Well, I don't know, but I'm applying to a USC, two CSUs, and the JC. I'm doing it all at the same time. So that way, some kids don't get left out. Uh, it's elevated the JC to the point it's, it's, a, it's a college. It's like, sorry, I don't know you, but maybe I had Oh, the right of first baby. So, but you know, the, the JC is a, is, a, is a viable option to get a four-year degree or an associate's degree. So we're pretty excited about what this jump start. And the JC is really excited because they're overwhelmed by how many kids show up in July totally unprepared, going, what do I do now? We, we said they stumble in. So we're excited about that. The JC is excited to work with anyone who's organized. Yeah. That's what we've learned. They're ready to work <laughs> with anyone. It's one of the things about the JC, I, I think it's a really unfortunately well-kept secret that all high schools should know about is that they have a couple of time arrangements with Berkeley and I think Davis. But if you go there and cheat, it's like a fast track, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And, and those colleges aren't easy to get in anymore. No, they're not. You know, so they have. I just want to <laughs> pipe in here because my kids, all three of my kids, transferred. They have transfer agreements with a lot of schools. My son did not do one at San Jose State, but my two daughters did. My oldest with Davis and my youngest with uh, Santa Cruz. And I think that might inspire some kids who maybe come up a little short. Mm -hmm. They didn't get into Davis or Berkeley or something. But, um, and it's, it's important to know that. I thought that was one of the, unfortunately, best kept secrets in, in um, President. There's a lot of secrets, and that's part yeah. of elevating the, the JC with the number of students we have to the same level as a CSU and a UC in terms of the efforts, the advertising, the marketing we put in, and the efforts we put into those kids. That was exactly where I was. And if you do it early enough, in the spring you can do concurrent enrollment. So those, you know, the students who have it together, they could actually start at the JC in the spring, actually get their college education going instead of waiting till July and, and hoping you get what you need.
And recognizing it early is also part of what Eric mentioned with that new curriculum of setting that 10-year plan and someone who might get to their senior year and realize they want to go to a four-year and you haven't done X, Y, and Z to make yourself eligible, identify them earlier and identify what can be done. Is this being integrated into the counseling? And the yeah, actually, the, myself and Sharon Howell sort of cooked up this scheme together. We sort of came at it from two different angles and sort of cooked up this scheme. And she and I have been meeting almost monthly with a team from the JC to get the, the timeline going for next year. So I'll transition us to the to the ass. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, how are you guys feeling? Let me put okay, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Oh, please. please. <laughs> My only other question is, I'm not a big average guy. Like averages, of statistics. I mean, they don't always give a very good picture. I mean, the average weather of the day across the United States was something. I might have had to bring out an umbrella, you know. So, it, it, the idea is that where does our A through G, our what's called our college readiness, where people are qualified to go, whether or not they choose to do that, because we know there's military options and dad's business mm -hmm. options, blah blah blah. Where do we stack up, say, in the state of California and maybe across the nation? I mean, on comparable cities, that, have you seen any of those that have been done? We're not bad. We're, I've seen 44% and 46%. I see a lot of 20s, percents, 22s. We had an interview with someone today, and at, at that person's school, it was 22%. Um, there's lots of things that go into what makes a, a, a large A to G number. And it's one of the things that, that we've done is expository reading and writing. So it's an ERWC at the 12th grade level so that students who are conditionally ready on the English portion of the EAP, Early Assessment Program, if they take and complete the ERWC course in 12th grade and get a C or better, then they become ready, no longer conditionally ready. So they become not only A to G ready, but now they can go on and not take a remediation course. So that saves kids money, it saves parents money and time. I mean, those are the critical things. Um, the other part, we talked about it earlier, about making sure the coursework is A to G, but making sure the kids are getting there and taking it. Right. So well, and the, and the room to grow example, sure. has been very willing, to, because we're organized, I, I asked them for all their placement test data. So I just recently got it. I can look at what percent of our students test into college level math at the JC. And we're working on getting that, the, the, just for CASA, what percent of kids get an associate's degree, what percent transfer. Because again, you're right, you kind of, it all gets wrapped into these averages, and you, know, you can tell something's missing, and are they, are they the same kids? So because of what we've done, they've been very willing to, to go the extra mile to try to get more detailed information about that. Also, the value of having to do it early, I think, is astounding. That's fabulous. To do it in March instead of in July, mm -hmm. that changes the trajectory of the kid when they get there. But this is a serious yeah. college. This is no, this is no joke. You're not taking a PE course in a fencing. You're, you're, taking, <laughs> you're in college. You get ready for it. You're doing exactly what everyone else did to get there. So it also helps to avoid when you do wait the last minute. A, a young lady, just to cut them high up, um, applied, and I guess the deadline was 12 o'clock. Um, unfortunately, she was applying out of state in Texas. 12 o'clock gets mm, lower no. than it does in California, but. Texas A and M or something. They 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 had some mercy and everything worked out. But it, it, to your point, that early stuff, there's always a few wrinkles or yeah. forgot to attach this or forgot to do that. And I find that's invaluable to get that the bounce back real quick from the colleges. You know, and yeah. it just helps to be prepared. Early. Kids in town have been conditioned to think of the JC as quote just the JC. I'm just going to the JC as though it's secondary, it's not as good as what other kids do. And yet we know, even from within this room, that it can be as good. And for many families, is the best decision that they can make. So, you know, we're trying to change the, 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 the culture of perception around the JC. It's not just the JC. I want to see kids saying, I'm going to the JC with a plan. Right? Yeah. Right. I don't care if the numbers change. The JC number could stay at 50%. If I want the other number to go up so the kids can choose. I'm going to the JC because I'm going to save some money and time. I'm going to do just what the Cruz Mahis did. We're going to save time and money, and we're going to go on to a four-year school, and we'll get our degrees. Smart family. They did the right thing. Oh, and it's a wonderful mm -hmm. junior college. I mean, yeah. if you look at the way it's rated throughout the nation, it's a great school. We've had put, they've, you know, gave birth to a lot of people who have gone to other colleges. But, and I tried to tell my kids, I'm not just trying to do this because it's cheaper, because it was. 
because I'm one of those families. My husband and I do, do not have a college degree, and all three of my kids will have a four-year degree. And I tried to tell them, I'm not just trying to be cheap, although that was part of it, because I stayed at home when my kids were little and I didn't have a big pot of money. But I said, it is a good school. And Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Sure. So, so, CASA got started looking at all this data as a result of the SLC grant. Um, they were written into the original objectives of that grant. Um, we said we would look. We tried in earnest to do what we said we, we would, and we did, and we learned a ton. And I think we're in the process of really changing Casa Grande. Um, we don't have any of this data without that grant originally paying for two sections, two, two sections of um, Scott's time, which was expensive, but I would argue, you know, a drop in the bucket. It's a small investment for what we've learned and the trajectory that it's sending us on. Um, the grant ended last year, as you know. Our site council has agreed to pick up one section for Scott this year. So the site is paying for it because we believe in it, because it benefits kids at CASA. Uh, what we have now is Petaluma High doing the same thing, which, which really leads to our first ask. Wait, there's one one. There's two. <laughs> there's actually five. <laughs> we limited well, just two. Us two Last year there were three. Uh -huh. Um, so the, the first ask is that the board consider, the district consider picking up a point two or one of a teacher's sections at each of the four secondary schools. Uh, Does this include Petaluma yeah. Junior High and Kenilworth? So that we can specifically work on that bridge between eighth grade, of course, and the high school. So we know more, learn more about eighth graders and their transition into, into ninth grade, setting them on a trajectory that's college and career ready as what, early as possible. What do you mean by with district coordinated? Let me just speak to that. Sure. So we, we went to the, uh, Washington twice during the grant. And one of the things that we saw is that, for example, if, if, the, if the district has a data person, that, that data isn't going to go anywhere. It has nothing to do with the competence of that person or, or my relative competence. It's the fact that you don't even know what to look for unless you're on site. That, that was one of the unique things about our school at those grant conferences. That I was the only teacher there. So I was doing all this as a, as a teacher. I, I know my people, the way teachers are. Okay, I know, I mean, we, we have a way. Okay, people. I think they are. And so there, there are things I could do that an administrator couldn't do, the district office couldn't do. There are things I would know to look for. When I go through those transcripts, I know the kids. I know what I'm looking at. So when I start pulling out all these things, I, I know what to do with them. I know how to present them and how to couch them. At the same time, I know these guys are kind of just getting started. I know there's stuff at the junior high that I don't even know what to ask yet. And so there still needs someone at, at the district level that's coordinating a lot of these efforts, as well as some of the things, what are some of the things you would like? What are some of the things at a district level that we would like in terms of, in terms of these data sets? So it's kind of a, it's not like a full-time person at the district, but I gotta, like I'll, I'll, you know, I'll badger Joelle and Curtis about something. I'm going, well, should I be badgering her? Is she the right person? Is, is that too much on her plate? Um, so just to know I have, I have someone that says I can go to. When we do the queries for the National Student Clearinghouse, that should just, we just do it at the, at the district level every July. We, we don't yet, but that's just something we need to do because it has socioeconomic data in it that we can't get at the local sites. So there's just some pieces of it that need to coordinate the fourth. And the whole idea of site specific is because of that, because of your lack of better term knowledge of the neighborhood. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's, a, that's a huge chunk of it. I, I, the, the ideas come to me, I can see what's there. I, I know who to present them. When I present this data to the English department, I present it differently than I do the math department. There's, there's a whole different dynamic to the way things Yeah, work. you can't use stats with English, right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> right, David? I, mean, I don't even know what you just said. <laughs> yeah. no, we strategize before we go into each room, sure. which needs to hear different things and needs them packaged mm -hmm. in a different way. And you can only right. do that, or you're going to be far more successful right. doing that if you know the culture of the school you're in. And there's currently a stipend. I know that Andrew's getting a, a stipend. But a lot of this just takes too much time to be a, 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 an add-on. If I were doing this as a stipend, a lot of that data you've seen here and seen these pages I'm going to give you wouldn't be there. 
I couldn't get it done. And you know, just finally on this point, um, Scott and I presented in Washington DC on three different occasions, each time invited to present to show different data sets. The last presentation we did was really on how to compile smart data to deliver to a teaching staff. So, you know, Scott's point that he was able to do something that other schools weren't because he's a teacher um, was recognized at that level. The, the, the second bullet point, in, in a way, is, is more obvious. So at both high schools, we have a person who's on site getting paid very little, um, four hours a day, to do what is an incredibly, increasingly complex and difficult job, to navigate college enroll enrollment, to get kids employed, to manage uh, work permits, and so on. There's a data set that we're gonna show you about how many CASA seniors are accessing the College and Career Center. And you're gonna see that it, it hovers just above 60%. That's well over 200 kids who are accessing this place. Um, that's still 40% of our graduating kids who aren't accessing the College and Career Center. So the second ask is that you know at both high schools, this should be a full-time certificated person who really knows how to navigate college enrollment. Um, we think it's that important, and we think that the nature of, of college and its competitiveness, competitiveness and the enrollment process has changed since this position was created in this district. It's changed dramatically, and, and, and so should the position. I think that some parents make public versus private school decisions based on that second bullet. They go, I'm going to go to... I'm going to say Ursuline, which doesn't exist anymore, so I'm safe to say it. I'll go to Ursuline because I know that there's a college and career counselor who will get my kid into college. That they'll teach him or her well, but I know that they'll get a lot of that interaction. Cardinal Newman, you might hear the same thing now. And I think that one of the ways public schools compete is by having that kind of position to say, no, 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 we do that just as well. We have a counseling staff that helps with academics in the 9 through 12, but we have someone to really set sail on where that student's going to go beyond the high school. Each site, have a four hour we have a 20-hour week each at each site, yes. But not certificate. Not certificate. So if we did not want to bog the board down with data sets. Um, we got a little carried away last year and decided to go a different route. So we really try to keep it there. Simple, but we're going to bog you down with a handout. Um, and I, I just wanted to, you all to see the thoroughness of of the data we're looking at that helps to generate some of the charts we're looking at. So a lot of it's a sample. We, we gave you just the, the final numbers. Uh, this is some more of the details. Um, senior survey on the front. One of the things we do is we survey all our seniors. And one thing I do want to point out, this is something that the data guy pays attention to, is look how many surveys responded, how many seniors responded at the very top of that. 340. It's essentially the whole class. So this isn't just sort of a little halfway job. We're going out there and we're finding what, what their opinions from every single kid out there. That's the kind of thing that Eric and I do. I coordinate the, how, what, what the lab, how you get in there, and how you get that done. Um, you'll see some samples from the National Student Clearinghouse. You were asking about the numbers on where they go. It's a six-year thing. It's just a big, giant chart. Um, it, it's also in there. Um, and then there's some, also some trend analysis stuff that's just bar graphs so you can see. We just gave like 2013 data, but how are we looking since 2008, for example, so. Um. Is this, uh, for anonymized, is that what it This doesn't need to be shredded, I can use No, it's there's, there's, it's just, yeah, there is just okay. yeah, college most names. Of the, the most of it's there. public, yeah. Okay. So I just have, I guess, one question, and I'll end with it. We're, we, let's keep yeah, going. We have one more hour and then we're done. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> this is stuff, so. I don't want you to ever feel like you have to compress. Thank you. Right. Uh, I have kind of a final question, but I'll throw it out to you. I just would like to, to, to mention that um, on the district leadership team, one of the areas that the group has incorporated into the plan that will be presented next month um, incorporates the, the, the college and career stuff 
in elementary, junior high, mm -hmm. high school with much more aggressive four-year planning. The grant that Costa Grande has, it's, was it two-year grant? No, five. Uh, five. five. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. It's ended now. It ended years. last year. Yeah. So this past year, you've been doing it. <coughs> on around. Right. I have one exactly. period of the site now. Yeah. And you have one period. Right. But you'd like two periods at each site. Well, what we're asking for is just period. one, one at each site per site per yeah. site. And incorporated junior high. Right. Yeah. And does Pedro and I have someone interested? <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, the question I have then would be, you know, I guess for everybody, but given that, what does this look like? What does this report look like next year? In other words, magic wand, there you go, here we start. What's this look like next year? Well, I can tell you one, one big one I think will be what, what the outcome of the jump start and uh, the, our JC kids are. How many kids we get enrolled at, ahead of time, how many take that counseling 270, possibly the concurrent enrollment. Um, as far as the data, hopefully we will have the data on what are our students doing at the JC, what's the percentage on the associates, um, as well as more details on the placement data going into it. It's really interesting to the math department is how are, it's fine if you're taking algebra two, but if you place down here on the placement test, it doesn't matter what class you take. So those are some of the, the big data sets relative to the JC that, that I would like to see happen. I'd also say that if Linda and I scheduled it, we would schedule Andrew and Scott in common press, and potentially the junior high and the two junior highs in the same place, so that they could get together. These are both very smart people, and Jumpstart sounds fabulous, something we should do too. Andrew's going to come up with ideas to share with Scott, and that's how good people create great programs, because they get together and they work together. So. The value is not just a prep at a site, it's getting these four people together to, to create whatever that district coordinator might want to see. So it, it allows a synchronicity and something really good to have. Well, and I think it's going to allow us to start prioritizing preparation for college readiness. Um, all of these data points are outlined and addressed in the new LCAP plan guiding the district. It's going to be really hard to do all of them at once. So if, if we're not organizing the data at all the different sites, I think there's a good chance we're just going to be throwing stuff at the wall without any real direction, wondering what's going to stick. So we've worked a little bit over the course of the year um, and just had a, a meeting uh, two days ago. And just in two hours, putting this together, have ideas, you know, and one of them has been mentioned. The JC thing keeps rising to the top as a very high priority. It's mentioned in LCAP, but not identified as that kind of priority. So that, you know, part of what you're going to see is the, the, the impact of collaboration across town, which we need desperately. Well, that's, that's a great point, because while I like that our elementary school, but all of our schools have their own little cultures and communities and things. If you live here, you should be able to go to the school that you live by and not fear, well, gosh, over cost, they've got this great counseling department that they don't have at Petaluma. Mm -hmm. So I, I know you like your friends and you wanted to go there, but i got to make sure you go to college. You know, some things need to be at both or all schools. Right. So. That's where the district coordinating presence can, can right. be affected. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anything else you uh, no, thank you. I appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for your guys' time. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you. Thank you so much. I read this last one. I love it. It's my question. I think everything can be used. Okay, we're going to take a real quick break. All right. We're back. Great. May realize. Well, welcome, everybody. And um, so I'll have to put that in my little, you know, hat when uh, we're considering what we can add to the budget. So it's a great presentation. All right, so the May Revise. Um, there's really not much different uh, than, than it was in January, except for one kind of big thing. And that thing is the uh, State Teachers Retirement System Unfunded Liability, which is in the billions. and. Originally, they talked about implementing something to help 
the uh, fund catch up and be fully funded, or at least quasi-funded, um, starting in 1516. Well, the main revised surprise is that they are wanting to implement uh, uh, additional payments starting in 1415. So that was, that's the big one. So the state contribution rate will increase, will double, just over double. Um, and they will continue to pay 2.5% of the payroll annually for the Supplemental Inflation Protection Program. They've been um, doing that all these years, but it's not enough, obviously. Um, the employer contribution rate will increase from what it is currently, which is 8.25%, to 19.1% over seven years. Coincidentally, that's also the seven years that we're implementing the L um, local control funding formula. It's not funny. Um, the employee contribution rate will increase from 8% to 10 and a quarter percent over three years. So the future look of STRS, 20 billion will be funded by the state, 8 billion will be funded by employees, and 47 billion will be funded what? by employers. Yes, and so That's this is what that tra trajectory looks like. Very visual. Excuse me? It's not a typo. <laughs> no, it's right not now. a typo. I wish it was. <laughs> 47 billion, yes. Um, and then, on top of that, we have the public employees retirement system, which deals with <coughs> the classified employee side of the retirement system. And it's not much different. How PERS over the years, um, they have fluctuated. And, and I would say too much. You know, really you should be looking at a trajectory that is, you know, maybe increasing, but not like this. You know, not spikes up and down. Well, they are actuarially off as well, and their proposal is to increase rates over the next seven years as well. And the current year rate is 11.4%. Next year, they're talking about going to 11.7%. And all the way out in 2021, they're actually talking about exceeding STIRS by going to 20.4%. What? So for those watching, when they are yes. talking about the retirement system that uh, employers and employees pay them being underfunded. Yes. And this is basically a rush to try to catch it. Yes, it is. Because in 2046 for STIRS, for example, they're saying that STIRS would be broke if we don't do something now. So it's sort of akin to Social Security mm -hmm. and we have to raise the contribution rate and that the future Yes, that is correct. And that's because they made these deals based on guaranteed returns in their material, right? Well, 7.75 7 and 3% yeah. market, that sort of nonsense. I mean, a few years, not that long ago, PERS, when we had that outstanding year, and PERS <laughs> was, <laughs> PERS was completely funded. It was over 100% funded. And then it went bust, just like that. And so they're not really looking at longitudinal data the way I think a lot of other people would. <laughs> so where's that money come from? Where's our, our portion going to come from? Right out of our general fund. Right out of the general fund. It's a component of the, of the, the state's giving us no more. It's nothing. That's right. They're paying the smallest part of it. Well, what, what they are giving us, they're telling us is that it will fund a huge component of this. And so that's money that comes completely directly right off the table when you're negotiating with bargaining units because Yeah, that's yeah. is that all part of that forty percent so, I mean, so the, shutting it down? It's forty percent on top of what the salary is. Yes. So you take the salary, you multiply it by forty percent, that's the additional contribution. So just for those no, who it's, well yes. It it's, will be. Yeah. She's right. It's going to be 40%. How do you get 40%? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. Yeah, you're not together. Yeah, you're not together. But 20%. It's 20%. Yeah, it's 20%. Right. That's still, it's still it's outrageous. A lot. Yes. That yes. we can't do that. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the same time. Yes, exactly. And when you consider the fact that, you know, we we have just added back the days that we had in 0708. And um, right now we're trying to find friends to, you know, uh, provide a cola, cost of living, because as we know, gas has gone up, food has gone up, everything has gone up. Now, um, health insurance is going up. So how, how do we find raises with limited resources? We're not one of the districts that are you know, high on their unduplicated count of socioeconomic students, so we're not getting a 20% increase in our revenues to help afford these type of cost increases. It's going to be very difficult. Unduplicated count of Socio-economically Socio disadvantaged students or low-income students. Un unduplicated, is that right? Um, right now, the, the local control funding formula is um, the supplemental dollars that we get are, um, they go towards um, low-income students. Um, uh, English, English language I, I learners and foster kids. So, Suppose you suppose you are uh, oh, so a low income. Right, right, right. Yeah. You, only you, only you only get counted right. once. You only get funded it four at once. Yeah. So our district is not outrageously high in that unduplicated count, where lots of districts who have like a ninety percent unduplicated count are getting twenty percent increases in their revenues year over year, as the local control funding formula is is phased in. Yeah, to the 2021 year. I just got out of the end, but basically what you're saying is districts that have a perceived additional need are getting additional funding for that reason. Right. And these triggers, we're not high on the trigger. We are not. We're not able to you know, give uh, raises or salary increases because we're sort of increasing the that. So it's, the, the bottom line is the, the current workers are, are balancing the pensions that are being paid out for who's ever retired mm -hmm. now yes. to keep it solid. Yes. So it's a disproportionate share of being balanced on that to be taken to pay. Yes. And that's the state's idea of local control. Um, yes, that's an interesting way to put it. <laughs> yes. And is this happening for sure as of August or September, or they're just putting it out there now that it may? Well, we know that the governor has gotten a lot of his way and since he's been governor, and, and for a lot of good reasons, too. I mean, basically putting this off a year isn't going to help anybody. So putting it off till 15, 16, well, yeah, it just means that over that course of time, it's, it's got to be made up some point. Um, there is pushback because it is a big ticket item. Um, it's going to cost the district an additional $385,000 for 14-15 for the one and a quarter percent increase for STIRS, and another $50,000 for the change uh, in PERS. Just for that point three percent So the May revised where we were hoping because the economy was going well that we would have additional funds is actually a negative because we're going to yes. have the 400 something out that we had not planned for. That is correct. See, that's going to go right back into the red. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so, so this is our. Yeah. So, what does this graph combined with PERS and STIRS look like? Right now, um, it represents about 5.4% of our budget. By the time we hit 2021, it's going to represent just under 12% of our budget. And that's the trajectory. So this, I've done calculations year over year about what this looks like. This is based on our regular certificated salaries. Um, we do have some costs, substitute teachers who come in who are eligible for um, service retirement contributions. And this does not include them because I you just don't know who they are. But so that's the that's the basement. That's right. The minimum that we need to 
Yes, they sell it. That's right. And so here you can see that we're paying 2.2 million. And then here's our year over year increase. This combined increase up into 2021 is about just under $3.6 million over the next seven years. It's huge. PERS, same thing. It's not quite as, because PERS is already high. We're already at 11.4% in the current year. Um, this is just a, about 1.1 million over the, net, over the course so of the seven years. So 4.7 million yes. for the two. Yes. And how much additional funding do you think we are expecting on the local control funding formula from this year to 2021 when it's supposed to be fully funded? Uh, yeah, we'll look at our multi year projections. Okay. <laughs> so, um, kind of going back to the. Mr. Cook, I'm assuming that that forecast is built on some kind of expected return. Right? I mean, they have forecasts on how well they've got, and now we're. I don't know if the numbers are really here, but is it a reasonable number? Um, are that's we not looking at 7.75 again, or are we looking at 2%? 2%. Four, as, as, as the forecast of how the. Right. How STIRS is going to do oh, okay. during this time, and this is the catch up number based upon that projection. Right, so actuar actuarial studies, you know, should be done. As Steve says, they're, bad, they're, they're useless after two years, and I don't know how often they perform actuarial studies to do that analysis. Both STIRS and PERS earnings have been relatively high. When you're looking at that 7.5% uh, figure, um, both of them. Like, were in double digits last year. Yeah, last and year. Then you had six years they did it. Yeah, well, actually for two years they did it. Mm -hmm. um, they even did fairly well. They were doing well before and even right after the um, recession they did very well. Their average, but is that sustainable is the question. Well, they I haven't mean, decreased it substantially. My question is simply, is the number a reasonable number? Or, or is this the teaser Really, I'm just going to be so much more. Or, or some That's where the actuary said he will. They're trying to pull off. It has to be done. Mm -hmm. But you don't have an opinion on the I, I really don't. I'm not close enough to it to have a gauge on that. Um. But if they do do well, if they overperform, we can expect some money back. Well, <laughs> darn it. yeah, that's the problem with yeah, trying to do this problem. projection out to 2021 is that you have to do it every two years and it changes substantially. So, that's the big news of the May revise. And there's no, um, we had really, really hoped for a second round of Common Core one time money because we really need to expand the infrastructure. We need serious professional development as we look at common core implementation. I don't think that that fight is over yet. There's a lot of people out there still saying we need this money desperately to implement this right, do it the right way. And it is a huge, huge change. Um, so we'll see. The other big battle that's out there is the adding another grade level to um, the K-12 system, the pre-K. Well, right now, when you look at the needs of, of the districts financially, I don't even know how they can remotely consider adding another grade level, not only because of just pure financial reasons, but facility-wise. We do not have the capacity right now to add another grade level to our facilities. I do believe Steinberg reversed his opinion and position on that. Um, and as opposed to adding another grade, he's looking to eliminate TK from K-12 and move it to preschool um, because of the cost and because of facilities. So that's, um, that was a reversal that was um, noted last week. Would that affect our TK? It will if he eliminates the funding. We will, those students, will be September, you know, will be the start date and anyone who's born after September will not be eligible for um, go back for all Yep. Mm -hmm. So circling this back around to the district and taking a look at what this translates in for the district, um, 
13-14, we had an overall growth of 180 students. Next year, we have a little plateau, a slight decline projected here. 15-16, um, just real modest, small amount of growth of 52. And then in 16-17, another even half of what it was in 15-16. So not very much happening in the way of average daily attendance and enrollment. So this is what our multi-year projections look like before we go into any changes, OK? So this $4.3 million of unappropriated in our current year is very little difference between the second interim and where we are right now. Um, in 14-15, we had projected if everything stayed the same status quo, we include our usual um, step and column cost, and that's pretty much it. We're deficit spending by about a half a million dollars. Without STRS being STRS purse factor. This in. doesn't reflect that change at this point. Okay. Um, yeah. And yeah. we would wind yeah. up with a three point nine million dollars fund balance. In 15, 16, you can see where our net increase decreased. We're actually positive by just under $2.7 million. And in 16, 17, we are $3.5 million to the good. Um, so talk to me about the difference in total income in 14, 15 versus 15, 16. It's a big number. It is a big number. I, um, 14, 15 is a little understated, and we're finalizing all of our numbers now in the budget process and dotting all of the I's and crossing the T's. Um, it is a big jump. From 13-14 from to 14-15, it's about a 4% increase. And then from 14-15 to 15-16, it, it jumps by to 7%. And then in 16-17, it's about 6%. That's using the um, FICMAP yep. calculator. The FICMAP calculator. So we have a little bit of growth, so that's a component of it, but not a huge component. Um, but yeah, this this is the trajectory of what it's showing me, and that I hope they're I hope they're right because this is the only tool that I have to gauge where we are um, revenue wise. Um, and so that this is the new local control funding formula that we still don't know what we're getting from this year. It's a snapshot of the lead to the seed of the whole funding process. Right. So. <laughs> the other thing that is making probably a little bit of difference in 1415, our statutory COLA is 0.85%. In these out years, it's 2.1% in 1516 and 2.3%. So that's something that we haven't seen here. And that's adding, that's a component of that right. larger increase. And those always change. Yes. But and that's good. something we're <coughs> some analysts to read with analysts. That's the best yeah, projection yeah. based yeah. upon mm -hmm. today's information. Today, which so clearly not clear. <laughs> no, actually, it was about a week ago information. So yeah, it's already changed. Okay. At some point, uh, you know, I say this never to memorize all work that goes into that. No. But wow, what do I do with that one? I mean, I start a little random checks based on Um. Yeah, it gets challenging. Um. Everybody needs to remember that a budget is a living document. This is only one day's point in time. And the information that I get tomorrow can change this. Um, there's other changes going on that as we um, head into 1415, we're looking to take back the um, some of the SCO special ed programs. And so there's a dynamic going in involved with that about how, how do I budget the revenues and expenses for that those programs that are heading back here. There's a little bit of ickiness there. And I think the difference, and I guess the, the point that I was trying to element of make was that we have no control of that and virtually no control of that. Mike was doing it for his business. He can decide it's going to work hard for you. It's going to 
going to bill more hours or hire more attorneys. Or there's things that you can do to control both the income and the expense side, but the income side, it just is. Right. Yeah. We can do bank sales. Car washes, maybe. But that's, oh, that's a lot of, of Well, you know what? We're in a drought, so forget the car wash. Yeah, yeah. That's not happening. <laughs> and that was one of the points. We're relying on the number of Yeah. So, anyway, so as you can see, before any changes are being incorporated, we wind up with, in 1617, with an unappropriated fund balance of about $10.1 million. So what have, what's been added in this next projection that I'm going to show you? Um, a 2% COLA that is currently being negotiated with bargaining units um, for the teachers and the classified. Um, we do include the STRS 1.25% increase, HERS 0.3% increase, summer school $80,000. This is a component of the LCAP. This is addressing our low achieving below basic and far below basic needs students. We are adding back two custodial positions. No, that, that was $366,000. No. No. That number is three times what you gave the last time. No, yes. that's that's the cumul cumulative impact so you're over three the three years. Over, over three, three years. years. This okay. is the three what year impact. impact. Oh I'm my gosh. Like, oh. Okay, yes. <laughs> Poor people just shot in their resumes at home. <laughs> <laughs> we, do have, we do have a position open currently. No, no. That is the cumulative impact. Okay. So as you look at that $10.1 million unappropriated reserve, you're going to chunk down that $10.1 million by 2.72 for the COLA. Okay. Um, the STIRS, $1.4 million. HERS, $409, set up. Um, we are adding back two custodial positions. This has um, significantly impacted how we operate and clean our schools, and the t everybody wants those positions back. Um, and then elementary Spanish, like the two uh, McDowell Elementary and McKinley. Okay? So, what does it look like? Okay. Voila, there goes the $10.1 million, and now we're down to just under $4.5 million in our 1617 um, uh, ending balance trends analysis. You can see that we end up deficit spending by $2.2 million, roughly. Um, we are just a little bit above a break even at 1516 with $826,000. And that 3.5 million out here in 1617, you know, went down to 1.5. Okay. So for our future meetings, let's see. Our next meeting is June 10th. We will be having a public hearing for the budget and the local control accountability plan. Um, and then on June 24th, the board will be actually adopting the budget and the LCAP together. And that's about it. Does anybody have any other questions? That's, that, I, I was looking forward to the May device. Yes. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking that we were going to have some good news. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Comments from the public? I have one speaker card. Yep. Yeah. Well, this may be the last time we'll be gathering as a group. Tonight, I will present ample evidence of this school board's failures to fulfill its own Petaluma City Schools District bylaws. Not fulfilling these bylaws has consequences. You may not be able to serve out your terms, as you may be facing serious governance civil and possibly criminal charges for your negligence. Paperwork is being filed this week. I have attempted to educate you 
I gave you books to read. I sent you videos. I sent you scientific evidence. I beseeched you for three days in a row in late March to please meet with me so we can please discuss alternatives to wasteful litigation. You refused. Every single one of you refused. Refused every phone call, refused every email, had no interest in actually charting a course for this district to spend our public money wisely and provide a safe learning environment learning environment for our students and teachers. On the 25th, this is my third and final appeal for you each to please meet with me individually on Tuesday, March 25th or Wednesday, March 26th to discuss any alternatives we have to litigation. I made email and phone call requests to each school board member for three straight days. Litigation is not the best solution for anyone. Forcing citizens to pay out of pocket to mount litigation to get Petaluma City School Board to follow California state law is unconscionable. When you go to gamutonline.net, you will see that there are bylaws up there, and they are about what your roles and responsibilities are. And when you tick them off, there are four of them, you have failed in all four. Number one, you failed to establish long-term vision for the district that provides for a safe learning environment for its students and employees. That's a failure. You failed to maintain a basic organizational structure for the district with respect to adopting policies, curriculum, and a budget that provides a high quality education for students delivered in a safe learning environment in a way that spends our public money wisely. You fail on that one. You fail to ensure accountability for program effectiveness and fiscal accountability with respect to common core technology infrastructure and educational purpose. The evidence of this is on videotape by Petaluma Community Access Television. You can view it on January 14, 2014. Four, you fail to provide community leadership and advocacy on behalf of the health and safety of the children that are attending Petaluma City Schools. That's your largest failure. For that, you may not be able to serve out the remainder of your terms. I've reported the failures of this school board far and wide to the highest reaches of our state and federal elected representatives and to the board of the directors of the California School Boards Association. I shared with you on April 8th the night you had somebody arrested for no reason, uh, that I got a letter from Diane Feinstein. Diane Feinstein wrote me back. Quote, Dear Mr. McGavin, thank you for writing me. I appreciate the time you took to write, and I apologize for the delay in my response. I believe schools should be safe places where children can learn and grow without having to worry about threats to their health. Many Americans enjoy the conveniences of wireless services, but these conveniences should not come at the expense of public health, which is what is happening right here in the Petaluma City School District. Please know that I have made careful note of your comments on this important issue, and I will be sure to keep them in mind should legislation related to this matter come before the Senate. End of quote. The important scientific truths clearly establishing direct harm from microwave radiation in the scientific literature, over 20,000 studies, was shared with you. You heard it all on April 8th. That should be sufficient for parents to demand that our local governments protect our children from this unnecessary, voluntary, toxic pollutant. Unfortunately, Diane Feinstein was the only one we heard from. Friday, May 30th marks 84 days of neglect of the health and safety of California public school children by our highest ranking elected representatives, Senators Barbara Boxer, Congressman Jared Huffman, and Assemblymember Mark Levine. The same date marks over 365 days of the same neglect by many other elected officials. State Superintendent Tom Torkson, Sonoma County Superintendent Steve Harrington, Petaluma City School District School Board members Troy Sanderson, Michael Badley, Mary Schaefer, Sherry Klobowski, and Phoebe Ellis. Each of these elected officials, each of you sitting right here, have taken oaths to uphold the U.S. and California constitutions and to uphold California state law. But each is doing nothing while our public schools continually violate California Education Code sections 32060 to 32065, which prohibits, quote, the sale of toxic substances to schools and school districts for use in grades K through 6. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other public comment? Moving on to uh, report of activities and correspondence to school board members. 
We've got the West Side Relays, uh, North Coast Section Softball, and I should add North Coast Section Baseball. Some uh, North Coast announcing. I didn't know you did softball yesterday. Mm -hmm. oh. District Retirement Celebration, open houses at Pendleton mm -hmm. Junior High School in Grant. Uh, meeting with the Pendleton Junior High School principal. Uh, oh, I like that. Who wrote that? Oh. That's me. Very important. Thank you very <laughs> yes. much for that. All right. And I finally was uh, given the opportunity to go oh. to uh, Kenilworth, and that was so much fun. <laughs> that was really so much cute. fun. <laughs> so thank you very much for that. I really enjoyed that. You're welcome. Yeah. And uh, uh, Ben, that kid's a showman. All right, no kidding. Oh, totally <laughs> showman. Oh, he acts. Uh, so, I, did right. get, I did get to watch the video of that day when I was there for um, open house. So oh, did you get to see him? Yeah, I got to see Troy and the kid. There, there was definitely one natural <laughs> yeah. on the screen. Yeah, and that was one step. Yeah. <laughs> but Bill will get better. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. I appreciate that. That was very enjoyable. All right. Any other uh, uh, discussion on activities that we need to? So let's move on to the consent agenda. Since we didn't change the agenda, uh, and we're playing it as it lies, I'll take a motion for the consent agenda. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Looked at my way through here, consent consensus. That's what it said. Donations. Do I have anybody who needs to? Uh, Refuse himself from the donations. I can't imagine why, but I'll ask. Mm -hmm. No? So I will take a motion to. So Second. All those in favor of accepting the donation? Oh, wait, 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 wait. I just wanted to share with uh, you that we had a very special donation provided of $40,000 to support the Family Resource Center at McDowell School. Wow. And Jane, I don't know if you want to add to that. We, would, we were right at the point where we were. Um, looking for money everywhere because we were going to have to um, consider closing the Family Resource Center. Uh -huh. And we had a community member step up um, to support um, the continuance. And now we're looking for several other grants um, that we can match with that $40,000. And it's enabling us to apply for a couple of other grants to keep things rolling. Nice. Yeah. Is there an acknowledgement of this community member that we want to uh or is this an anonymous, and this is an anonymous donation? I right. wish to remain in the law. Mm -hmm. Thank you, well, Mr. Mr. Thank you, anonymous person. Yes. That's a good deal. Okay, so all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, 5 uh, Purchase orders. So we want to approve the list of purchase orders. And again, so, ask if anybody needs second. to bow out. Do anybody need to bow out? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Badley needs to bow out of the purchase orders. This is Osher did. Okay, so with Mike abstaining, I will. I heard a motion and a second. I thought I heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Sorry, Aye. I jumped the gun. I said I didn't oh, <laughs> 401. I'm a little off my game tonight, so <laughs> you and I, it's only been seven years of us together, and I'm screwing it up, I <laughs> promise you. Sorry. No, no, it's all me. Uh, so that's. Four O oh, and one, and then same uh, list of expenditures. So anybody that needs to fail on that? I do. Mike also needs to. I do not. No. Okay. So, Mary, did I have a motion for you? Yes. Yeah. And I had a motion for yes. or a second. Yes. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. So that's again going to be four O oh, and one. Um, do, 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 do. Any discussion on the financial reports? No. no. All right. Moving on to educational services, do we have any discussion on the courses or textbook adoption? I just had a question on the courses. Um, when I know we have discussed the new international map stuff. When are we transitioning? We will be transitioning. Um, the year, the official transition will happen in fifteen sixteen. Okay. Okay. Because I was looking through the courses and I, oh yes, that's going to be coming. Probably soon. Right. Okay. So will it only affect incoming seventh graders who start in 1516? 
It, we're going to roll it. Um, we're going to do a report to you. We were going to do it tonight because there are so many reports tonight. We thought we'd put it off for a little bit. <laughs> um, so we will do a little report um, on the whole roll-in and phase-in of the um, Math 1 Integrated Science. I'm sorry, Integrated Math, because we're also working on Integrated Science. Um, to you guys probably next time. It'll be just be a short report on how we're going to phase that in. Okay? Okay. All right, any other discussion on that? Okay. Moving on to future business. What surprises do you have for us? Well, as Mitch shared, we're coming back with the um, public hearing. Actually, that's, yeah, at the next meeting mm -hmm. on June 10th, public hearing on the LCAP. So that'll be the first public hearing and the first LCAP that the board will so you've seen drafts of it today. And then um, the budget will be public hearing on that meeting as well. Historically, we've done the public hearing. At the same meeting, we've adopted the budget, but um, with the LCAP, it needs to be tied together at the meeting before and approval the next week. And when do you think we'll have a copy of that budget? Um, you will have, for the next meeting, you will have the um, tentative budget. Well, when do you think we'll have a copy of the tentative budget? Will, will it come in the Thursday or Friday package? Or? We will, yeah. I mean, we're, 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 I think we're pretty close to um, getting the so final budget. So in the Friday board letter, you mean? If you have, I just say, if you have it early, that'd be great. If you don't, that's understandable. Right. Can, can but you make you have it a separate early. attachment so it's not with all the, yeah, the newspaper board letters and all that? So that Friday I can, yeah, so that okay. it's easy to scan through the, that document yeah. and not all the other stuff too. Yeah, okay. whenever there's like a document over ten pages, it, it makes make it. its own attachment to the board letter. Otherwise, it's your. Okay. What was it? The hell then? Good suggestion. Day? Mm -hmm. All those pages. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The signatures. <laughs> all right, then I. I trying to get the graduation sheet. <laughs> then I'm going to. Uh, we need to reconvene back to close right. session to finish up uh, yep. a couple of items. Yep. And we'll be back. It could be one. Please stay if you'd like. Okay. Okay. Closed session items. So the board met in closed session to discuss uh, two things. The first thing is a um, student disciplinary action. It's case number 45. I'm going to go ahead and read that out and we'll have a vote on this. This is based upon evidence and discussion held in closed session, confidential evidence. So I want everybody to understand that there's a whole story that goes with this that the public will not get. Case 47, the case has been presented to the board that the student did commit an expellable act as defined by the California Education Code. Recommended motions to the board to expel and to suspend the site discipline team's recommendation for expulsion in accordance with board policy and to allow continued enrollment in a district operated school under mandated conditions. The student's suspended expulsion status will be in effect for one calendar year, so that will be through May 27, 2015. Conditions above subject to review with evidence of positive attendance, satisfactory behavior, life skills, counseling program. Community service and appropriate academic performance. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So that passes on a vote of five to zero. Then we did actually vote in closed session for uh, Casey waivers for uh, special education students. And uh, we have a number of them, so I'm going to not read them. I'm going to combine them. You can do it one night. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, after, and I'm just reporting out. So, after review of the evidence presented for students 1401, 1402, 1403, 1404, 1405, 1406, uh, and there were two for 1406, 1407, 1408, 1410, 1411, 1412 twice, and 1413. The Board of Education voted 5 to 0 to waive the Casey graduation requirement for math and or English under the provisions of Ed Code Section 60851C. That is all the closed session items that I have to report on, and I will take a motion to adjourn. So moved.
Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.